All right, we have a wipe here in our attendees. All right. Yeah, and Ty some... East, I know him. Yes, Ty, hi. And uh, welcome to the gentlemen who are right on time. We will be starting in a couple of minutes, um, and uh, we're happy to have you here. Good morning, Ty. All right, we will be giving just another two minutes before we get started. So just wanted to say hi to everybody. Ty, good morning. Good morning, David, and good morning, Stuart. Uh, good to have you all here. And good morning, Rhonda, welcome. All right, and we have Scott coming in. Good morning, Scott. Nice to have you here as well. We will get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, looks like uh, the people streaming in right now. Hi, Ike. Nice to see a familiar name again. And good morning, Edwin. <coughs> All right, we will be getting started in just under a minute. And uh, it's good to see everybody uh, here today. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Anne Ching, and I'm the CEO and founder of Supercharged Lab. And today we have with us two of the most amazing women that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing and meeting. Um, so allow me to introduce them. Uh, first, up, and first up, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Zucker uh, is managing partner at Interior Investments of St. Louis LLC, an Illinois limited liability company and a subsidiary of I3 Group Incorporated. In July 2004, I3 Group acquired Workplace Resource, a struggling $5 million uh, furniture dealership in St. Louis, Missouri, and through a hub and spoke business model and Elizabeth's leadership, Interior Investments of St. Louis has grown to a $40 million dealership. From its inception, the company has achieved tremendous annual growth is virtually debt-free and has solidified itself as the second largest Herman Miller dealer and one of the most sophisticated and fastest growing contract, contract furniture dealerships in the United States. Elizabeth was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, and she attended Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, where she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. Elizabeth, and how I knew her, was through YPO, she joined YPO St. Louis in 2007 and quickly became involved holding more than nine chapter officer roles, including forum moderator, membership officer, chapter chair, YPO gold liaison, learning officer, and forum officer. In 2014, she joined US, Central US Regional Executive Committee and served from 2013 to 2015 as the regional integration officer. In 2015 to 2016, she served as the Central U.S. Regional Chair, and in July 2016, Elizabeth became a member of the YPO Board of Directors, and this is why it's so important. Throughout her tenure, 
She served on the YPO Membership Committee, Governance and Succession Committee, Chapters, Regions Committee, Compensation and HR Committee, and YPO Council Chair and CRC Chair. In July 2019, Elizabeth was elected to becoming the YPO Global Chairman for 2019 and 2020. She currently serves as the Chairman Emer Emeritus until June 30th of this year, leads the Governance and Succession Committee as well as the HR and Compensation Committee. On a daily basis, Elizabeth attempts to keep up with the three children, Julian, Graham, and Henry, who will bring her unbelievable joy and happiness. And in her spare time, she stays fit by running, cycling, and shredding. Uh, you've got to tell us more about shredding at some point. Uh, and uh, with us today as well is Linda, who is a multi-award winning leader, keynote speaker, author, university professor dedicated to amplifying and extending the success of other high caliber business leaders. She's the founder and CEO of Lead Herchip Global, a community of unstoppable women enhancing their leadership movement and embracing their power to becoming the best versions of themselves in work and in life. In Leadership Global, uh, Linda supports and guides ambitious creative women to move in the direction of their purpose, their mission, their dreams with powerful connections, critical support, practical tools, and valuable resources to show up, speak up, and step up in their careers and personal lives. Prior to her role in Leadership Global, Linda was CEO of Collective 54, successfully launching and growing and scaling that firm after serving as global head of brand marketing, public relations, and communications at Susan, Susan G. Coleman. Linda forged an earlier career as an entrepreneurial and forward-thinking marketing executive on the cutting edge of brand marketing. When Linda served as the global head of marketing for YPO, she developed her passion for bringing inspir inspiring leaders together to create opportunity, discover, possibility, and solve problems. Linda has a PhD and MA in clinical psychology and has written extensively on the subjects of social comparison, depression, anxiety, subjective well-being, and personality theory. With a focus on relating scientific research to commonly understood concepts, and currently, Linda is interested in the psychology of influence, persuasion, and negotiation. Today, we're going to be speaking about breaking the bias in the boardroom. And uh, it's such an important topic for all of us. It's um, such an important topic for organizations globally now more than ever. We start with a panel discussion today, and then we will open up the floor for some questions from our audience, where my colleague Ian is on standby to notify us of your questions. Uh, by text, you can feel free to use the Q&A button uh, where you can type a question uh, at any time. Uh, and if you are unable to stay for the entirety of this uh, webinar, the recording will be sent to you for registry. So uh, with that, I guess let's uh, get started. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Um, so. I guess let's start with you, Linda. Let's talk a little bit about some of the um, statistics, the industry reports. Where do you think we stand um, in terms of boardroom and workplace equality as well as diversity today in 2022, where we're starting to emerge from a post-pandemic world? Yeah, really good question. Just to set the landscape and just to really understand where we are right now in terms of gender balanced boardrooms. Women still hold less than 15% of senior positions among Fortune 500 companies and less than 17% of Fortune 500 corporate board seats. And even smaller percentage are chairs, only 5% in 2019 and 2020, and only 4% are actually CEOs. So in 2021, among the largest 3,000 U.S. publicly traded companies, only about one in five board members are women. And that's according to Equilar, which tracks corporate governance data. It says that nearly one in 10 boards have literally no women. Um, so in my mind, diversity requirements should be considered and enacted among many states in the US and in many other countries. In fact, 
In 2018, California became the very first state to mandate a level of gender diversity when they passed a bill, SB 826, that actually mandates that any publicly traded company based in California has to have at least one female board director or they face a $100,000 fine. And I think that's because, again, there are such extreme um, polar opposites in terms of what we're trying to achieve in gender balanced companies, gender balanced initiatives, and what we're seeing in the boardroom. Um, the most extreme promotion of gender diversity actually occurs in Norway, where since about 2008, all listed companies, all listed companies have got to abide by a 40% gender quota for female directors, or they face disillusion. So between some of the more forward thinking countries and states like California and Norway, I think that they are setting precedent. They are setting an example of what's possible for women in the boardroom. Absolutely. Elizabeth, you spent a, a good amount of time um, working to um, lobby for you know, gender parity in the boards. In fact, as a uh, global chairman of the YPO Board of uh, Directors, I think that, there has been this um, personal journey. Can you share more about this personal journey to, to moving the needle to bringing more women to get a seat at the table? It's, a, it's funny, when I was elected to the board seat at YPO, I didn't think that much about gender diversity. And I was one of two women at the time on the board. In my second year in serving, I was the only female. And it was a really lonely place to be. As comfortable as I have always been in YPO, I felt lonely being the only female. And our board in general is extremely culturally diverse. We're from all different continents. Um, English is not over 50% of our boards first language, but the gender diversity was definitely lacking. I think what I'm most proud of today is that our board is about 20% female and we're working towards making it 30% female, which is, I always look at it um, within the entire organization, are, are we batting above our, our, our you know, or are we, are we overachieving? And I think in the case of YPO at 20%, at 30%, we're absolutely overachieving with that level of gender diversity at the board. But what struck me as the most meaningful component of serving as the global chairman of YPO and its 33,000 CEOs globally was the impact it had on the management organization. We have over 250 professionals that work for YPO and about 50 to 75 contractors at any given time, and they are predominantly female. The amount of inspiration that it provided to see a female member leading this membership organization to me was the part that meant the most. I didn't realize um, the power of having a female in that elected role. And Linda, you mentioned that fit less than 15% of corporate board seats are females and that less than five are chairmen. And I think that's what the, the target should be is females leading boards because then you have a voice, then you really have the opportunity to change the narrative and to really share um, and, and, and get some momentum going around gender parity. Absolutely. So uh, Linda, I, uh, how about you tell us a little bit about, you know, this concept of, you know, women, when they are, you know, trying to climb up the corporate ladder, how would you think um, they can propel themselves into positions of leadership? And how can we help them have a voice. I think it's so important because a lot of them just don't simply don't speak up. They they don't um, feel the, the that they are capable of uh, uh, you know having a seat at the table. So what can we yep. do to empower women? I love that, and I just want to comment on something Elizabeth said where she has set a goal and YPO as an organization has set a goal for 30% of the board members being female, which is amazing. And you're right, Elizabeth, that does set a new benchmark because globally only about 17% of women hold board seats as of last year and only 1.9% 
increase over the year prior. So we're seeing slow incremental change in terms of the percent of women that hold board seats. And right now it's globally at about 17%. So setting a benchmark or setting a goal of 30% would be just absolutely remarkable. So what we need to do to create gender diversity in boards, in my mind, is a combination of some well-publicized government targets. So we talked about Norway, we talked about California, Spain has a similar mandate. And so a combination of well-publicized government targets, support from big private firms, corporate governance revisions from regulatory bodies and supporting organization, and all of those working in combination, I feel like it's really vital to boost representation of women on boards. And there are some boards that are actually considering expansion as well. So adding new board seats. Um, of course, you always want your board to be odd numbers, seven or nine or 13, but being able to expand the board if needed, making boards represent the size of the company, the size of the corporation is important. And the other thing that I believe in all levels of leadership is what gets measured gets done. So measure the change you want to see and hold yourself accountable. As Elizabeth said, she set a goal of 30%. So I think if you set the goal, you hold yourself accountable and you measure what actually gets done, that can really move the needle. And I think it's important to solicit women who are interested in board seats. If you're in a position of leadership, actually reaching out to women who may be interested in board seats and help lifting them into those board roles is important. That can also happen not just if you are a woman on a board or in a position of leadership with influence to lift other women up, but you can enlist ambassadors to help women get on boards. You can enlist the, the allyship of men who are chairmen of boards or have influence on boards and ask them to uh, be a champion of women and recruiting women onto the boards, expose, expose more women to boards. So being able to get involved, be proactive and champion women, whether you're an ambassador, an ally, or your woman of influence, you're sitting on several boards now, being able to raise that as an issue and be proactive and lift other women into positions of um, board governance, I think is so important because again, having a gender diverse board is critical. Corporate directors need to be able to understand the markets that their companies serve, their employees, their customers, and some of the complex issues that are facing their businesses right now. And when half the planet is female, then it seems to me having women in positions of influence on corporate boards is an obvious benefit to the business, both large and small. I think the one thing to note, though, is um, step one is getting women on board. Step two is making them feel a part of that board. The inclusivity piece is equally, if not more important. Token females don't solve anything. If women don't feel comfortable and they don't feel like a part of the community within that board, and every board has a culture, maybe even multiple subcultures. And so I think when, you, when you're considering adding diversity to, to the board, you're doing it for diversity of thought. You're actually doing it because it's going to become more tedious. It's, you're going to create more friction by putting people on a board that don't all think the same way. But homo, being homogeneous doesn't get you to a better place. And so you have to lean into the friction. You have to lean into the um, idea of taking down the barriers and really creating um, equality at the board level and mutual respect. And I think if you can get there, and I think Stuart made a comment in the, in the chat, the board will be so much better. It will outperform a homogeneous board, which may be an all male board. Women work hard. Women work very, very hard. And in most cases in their own businesses or their own careers, they've had to work harder to get to the same place as a male peer. And they've been paid less to do so. And they're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and work hard. And another component I think of women, which is extremely valuable at the board level is their high EQ. Now, of course, that's, that's a generalization. Not every male has low EQ and not every female has high EQ, but women naturally tend to be more comfortable with vulnerability. They tend to be more comfortable with emotion. They tend to be very, very transparent. 
And I think that by adding those characteristics to a board, you become much stronger and much more cohesive. I agree, Elizabeth. And I will say that, you know, one of the points that you made that I think is so important is that, you know, a lot of scholars have found that women need to hold at least three board seats on any board in order to create critical mass. And that leads to better financial performance for the company. Reaching critical mass can actually change the boardroom dynamics substantially and actually create an environment in which innovative ideas can spring from gender diversity, where there's a sense of differing perspectives and worldviews and vantage points that actually strengthen the company. And research has also shown that diversity matters because it brings a broad collection of experiences, perspectives, backgrounds, viewpoints, all of which lead to better decision-making. So optimizing boardroom decision-making through gender diversity seems to me should be a critical goal for every organization right now. But you're right that being the token female or the token anything can lead to um, a little bit of um, loneliness, I think is what you had suggested, and also isolation. So being able to create critical mass by holding at least three board seats for women is a real game changer because it changes the boardroom dynamics, which is so important. Absolutely. I think one of the things is uh, that's preventing women from getting onto boards is, well, unfortunately, the fear. Um, and the statistics show that a more balanced boardroom does achieve a lot better outcomes. Perhaps let's talk a little bit towards the success stories uh, that, that you know, we've seen uh, of achieving more gender parity. What are some um, stories that you've seen or some learning opportunities that, that you've experienced? Um, perhaps, uh, Elizabeth, we can go with you, um, you know, to share a little bit about the uh, successes of having more uh, gender parity or even, you know, diversity uh, of uh, racial diversity uh, and, you know, uh, gender diversity and so on and so forth. What are some of the benefits? I think I mentioned this previously, the biggest benefits, diversity of thought, <clears throat> diversity of perspective, diversity of experience. I think the one thing, um, one really important component, especially if you're chairing a board is to make sure every voice is heard. Some people are more outgoing, they're extroverts by nature, they're comfortable voicing their opinions. Sometimes there's someone in the room that may be quieter and more reserved that has a really valuable voice. And so I think it's important to always keep your eyes and your ears open and scanning the room as you're facilitating or leading a board to think about who hasn't spoken, who, who hasn't said something. Maybe they haven't said something because they haven't been invited to do so. There are cultural nuances if you're on a global board that are inherent in all of us. Um, and being aware of those cultural nuances can make you a better board leader, a better board participant. If you happen to be in a role where you are leading governance, um, specifically if you're a diverse board member, raise your hand and volunteer to be in governance because Linda mentioned this earlier, if you set goals and you establish metrics for diversity on your board, most will achieve them over time. And if you don't set metrics and you don't have goals, you'll get what you get. And I think it is really important to have maybe a goal and a stretch goal. But um, one thing I always like to, to put in um, is I'm not a big fan of, um, of putting diverse members on a board just to do so. They have to be adding value. You have to put them in a position that they can be successful. They have to be either have the right skill set, the right background, the right experience, the right education, whatever it is you're looking for. And if you're involved in governance and you know what you need in order to be a more diverse and more successful board, and you're looking in all the right places, you will find it. And then it's just a matter of making those folks feel included and a part of the community when they join the board. Sure. How can we get, well, men, um, sorry, uh, to, to be a little bit more uh, open to the idea of having, you know, women on the board? I, I think a lot of it is the fear, right? It's it's the, they, they are afraid of, well, this, this is going to change the dynamic of how things have always been done. Um, and I think that is preventing a lot of women from joining boards. How can we help them overcome the fear? 
Well, I don't know if you're directing that to me or to Elizabeth, but I would say that, you know, those senior leaders that are either senior leaders in the management team or senior leaders in the board recognize that they can enhance their effectiveness by tapping a broader talent pool. Uh, and by tapping a broader talent pool for their directors, as Liz has said, you know, that add demonstrable value is good for the company, it's good for the board, it's good for management. And in fact, an S&P Global study in 2019 found that companies with female leaders became more profitable and posted better share price growth compared to market average. Um, those companies that had a gender balance board actually, again, were much more profitable, posted better share price growth. Um, and so, as Elizabeth said, there is this idea that women tend, not always, but tend to have a higher emotional intelligence quotient, but also specifically women are less likely to have attendance problems than men. Um, there's actually research that suggests the greater the number of women on the board, the better the attendance is, not just of those women, but it influences the behavior of male directors. And so the male directors of the board begin showing up more frequently. They begin engaging more intentionally. And women also appear to have a significant impact, as Elizabeth said, on board governance. We find a lot of evidence that more di uh, diverse boards are more likely to hold the CEO accountable for poor stock price performance, for um, you know, poor performance on all the success measures that that company has agreed to. And CEO turnover is much more sensitive to stock return performance in firms with relatively more women on the board. So in fact, there, there's a lot of research being done right now that showcases very objectively that having a gender balanced board is not only good for business, it's good for the board and the governance of that board as well. Absolutely. Um, we have a question from Mark uh, in the chat, which uh, reads, what are the representation percentages in management versus board at the board level female representation i would expect is much lower but what is the gap um i'm, I'm not sure if linda you can speak to this yeah i think um we talked a little bit about this early on um the research that i am most familiar with and that is most recent suggests that women still hold less than 15 percent of senior positions among fortune 500 companies and less than 70% of Fortune 500 corporate board seats, and even smaller percentage are chairs. As Elizabeth noted, she was the chair of the International Board for YPO, and that's when you can really instigate significant change. But right now, only 5% of uh, chair roles at boards are women, 5%, and only 4% 4 per, 4 or so are CEOs. So um, among the largest 3,000 US publicly traded company, only about one in five board members are women. Um, and one in 10 boards have absolutely no women. Wow, uh, that's fascinating. Sorry, Elizabeth, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that um, I think Mark was asking about the difference between the percentage of female leaders and senior leadership roles versus their board representation. And I don't know what that metric is, quite candidly, Mark, but I can tell you there's more women in leadership than there are in board seats. That's for sure. Um, thankfully, we're seeing many more women being promoted within private and public companies at the highest levels. And as Linda mentioned, half over half the world is female. So what's coming our way is going to be something very, very different than what we're accustomed to today. So I think that um, the tough part is getting, getting folks, no matter what gender they are, whatever race they are, getting them in the right places in the board so they can be effective. And I mentioned this already once, I think governance is such a great place for a diverse board member to reside uh, because you really can make a difference Linda, you keep talking about this, this gap that we have with females represented on the board. The number one reason is most public, many public boards do not have term limits. How do you make space for diversity on your board when nobody ever gives up their seat? It's impossible. And so I think by instituting term limits and goals around diversity, um, you can get there. 
But if you're going to allow everyone who's already held that seat to hang on to it for perpetuity, nothing's ever going to change. You have to sometimes force the change in order for it to happen. Oh, that's so smart, Elizabeth. And I think you also, as a woman, you have to position yourself for a board position too. You have to promote yourself in a strategic way. You have to do very simple things like make sure you have an updated LinkedIn profile, but you also have to be a thought leader. You have to lead with your thinking. You have to publish. You have to write. You have to be involved. You have to speak. And it's also really helpful to develop a specialty. As you said, Elizabeth, you know, you need to be uh, very judicious in those very few board seats. So every single person that holds a board seat has got to add value. So if you're looking to serve on a board, develop a specialty, global experience, technology experience, maybe multi-generational experience, work in SRGs, work in risk. Um, all of those things can really help uniquely differentiate you. If you have global experience or you're an IT or technology thought leader, you understand how to work in multi-generational uh, workspaces. And I also think that if you're a woman and you're interested in serving on a board, and I, I have the privilege of serving on three right now, but if you want to serve on a board, you also have to nurture relationships. You have to be authentically engaged with, with others and be curious about what that business is doing and how they can improve. And you need to do your research. You need to really understand the challenges that are facing that business. And you need to be very judicious and very intentional, very purposeful about the boards that you want to become involved in. And then, you know, of course, not only do you need to keep up your LinkedIn profile, but you need a board bio. Um, and as you're putting together that board bio, consider gaps that you don't have. Do you have financial acumen? Do you have financial responsibility? So I think you have to really be honest about where you have gaps and then fill in those gaps with training, with certification, with experience. So my recommendation is target the boards you want to be a part of. Choose a board that you're a fan of. You're a fan of that company. You're a fan of their products, their services. And then if you are creating your board bio and you realize there are gaps, go fill those gaps. Get the necessary um, experience and be very clear about what makes you unique. Develop a specialty. So cover your bases, but also stand out by being unique and offering something of value that that board would be uniquely benefited by, by bringing you on. So, so Mark made a comment in the chat about it being the responsibility of the chairman and the CEO to fire board members who are underperforming versus term limits. I think it's probably a combination of the two. I think term limits, set up, it's a mindset, right? When you come into a, a seat at the board and you know there's maybe a two plus two or there's a three plus three or a three plus one, whatever, whatever the the terms are, you have a mindset as to how long you're supposed to be in that seat. You would be shocked. I'm trying to remember the name of the report that I think it's Spencer Fain releases every single year. So there's an annual report on boards and public companies. You would be astounded how many do not have term limits. Folks that have 80 year old white males sitting on their boards and they've been on there for 25 years. So I, I always think about this and this is my YPO bias because in YPO, there's a whole champion or member-led component of the organization, and we all have terms. We all have limits. And I think about the, 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 the new ideas, the fresh perspectives that come about as a result of that cadence that is a natural part of our leadership component of this organization. And I think about how refreshing it is. And I think about how natural it has become that there is this turnover on a very regular basis within the leadership. This is essential at the board level because the management organization isn't turning over with that regularity. And so at some point, you have to allow that to become the norm. And if you start to have term limits, you get into some sort of a rhythm where that becomes normal. Then I think you have to have reviews. Uh, there should be performance reviews of directors, just like you review the leaders in your business. And, and you should be allowing them to be their best selves. You should be giving them second chances. But if they're not stepping up and they aren't adding value and they're taking a seat that could be held by somebody who is performing, you have to ask them to leave. I 100% agree. Absolutely. Um, I had a text come in from a lady who joined us uh, 
but had to leave because of a customer issue. And she had just uh, been appointed to her first board position. Now, what would be some advice or something that you wish someone had, you know, had told you when you first joined your first board? Um, what are some practical hacks, so to speak, that uh, a, a woman can position herself well for, you know, uh, really, well, rocking the board? Well, as Elizabeth noted, you know, the, every single board has its own culture. So being very clear about what that boardroom culture is like, I think is incredibly important. Of course, every board has fiduciary responsibility. So it's important that you have some level of financial acumen and that you're able to read p and like you're able to read, you know, the financials so that you can come fully prepared to that board meeting. Um, but what I have found in the boards that I've been a part of, I think I've served on six in total, in my career, um, transparency and openness in the boardroom is so important to have a healthy board dynamic. You need to always be respectful of management. Uh, you know, they are preparing for that board meeting, you know, weeks, if not months in advance. And you need to be respectful of the incredible amount of work that they've done to prepare you as a board member for that board meeting. And you as a board member need to be ready. You need to do your research. You need to have really studied the preparatory materials that the management team has provided for you. You need to be thoughtful. You need to be insightful, not disruptive. This is not about jockeying for a position. This is not about um, you know, hammering management. You don't want to be disruptive. You do want to be respectful, but you want to be thoughtful and insightful. And you need to be observant of the culture. Even seating arrangements, believe it or not, can be a very big deal. Um, so being very clear, even about something like seating arrangement. And the one, um, I guess, motto that I always use when I'm invited to be a part of the board is nose in, fingers out, which means that I want to deeply understand the dynamics of that company, but I am not responsible for doing the work. So I need to be res respectful of management who's got to actually operate and execute on board directives. So nose in, finger out. And as a CEO and as a leader, that can be tough because you want to get involved and you want to take on responsibility. But in fact, as a board member, your responsibility is simply to be relevant and help that company see around corners. Uh, you want to help that company make a convincing stories, especially if they are reporting to Wall Street. You've got to help them craft the story of their 10-year vision, their five-year vision, their current performance. So you need to help them craft the story. And that means that you need to be relevant. You need to help them see around corners with nose in and fingers out. That's my opinion. Linda, I agree. I think self-awareness is probably the most valuable attribute that a director can bring to the board. If you aren't self-aware, you're definitely stepping on somebody else's ego. Um, you're, it, there's no way you can, if you aren't coachable and you aren't self-aware, you won't be any good. It, it, it doesn't matter what your other subject matter expertise is. And I also, I was thinking about characteristics that really make a good director, authenticity, transparency, whatever you wanna call it, open mind, being open-minded. But the other one is a positive mindset. Nobody likes somebody who's negative, who's going to bring the whole room down. Um, even, no matter what the board culture is when you join it, you have the ability to influence it and make it better than you found it. And I think having a positive mindset and showing compassion and empathy are, are huge assets to any board and to any, any, anything that you do in life. And then you mentioned intentionality. I think the little things matter how people are seated in the room, what type of seating is in the room, how formal or informal does it feel? Does it make people want to be open and to share and to be vulnerable? You get to a better, higher place when you get people to open up and share their deepest, darkest thoughts about the organization and implement change or, or challenge. Uh, friction, how, how do you deal with friction? Do you have rules of engagement? Um, when you have varying um, perspectives. I know in having served in the YPO board at a global level, oftentimes we had very 
party dialogues around specific topics, and then we would vote. And when we walked out of that room, we had our arms locked and we were absolutely 100% aligned on the issue. And it didn't matter where you fell on it when you were in that boardroom, but when you were outward facing, you were aligned. Everybody was behind whatever decision had happened in that room. And you forgot about your own personal interests or your own experiences having walked in. And I think being able to flip that switch and feel good about it is really important. You aren't being unauthentic. You're doing the right thing for the organization by getting behind what the majority has said. Absolutely. So we're now round, uh, winding down for this uh, webinar. I'd like to invite um, any member if, of, of the audience to please uh, you know, uh, ask any questions, particularly for our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, Linda and Elizabeth have been very kind to uh, provide a very insightful uh, perspective about women in the board. So um, Mark and Stuart and uh, Andrea and Paula, if any of you have particular questions, uh, do raise your hand. We'll be happy to unmute you as well. Does anybody have uh, particular questions for our panelists? Ah, okay. So we're gonna unmute um, Stuart. Please go ahead. <clears throat> no, thanks. Thanks for putting this session on. You guys have made me aware of um, things that I wasn't aware of. So it's wonderful. Uh, ignorance is not bliss, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I have to go. And um, my final input for you is. Um, I wouldn't coach women to fit in, you know, to the dysfunction of the male dominated company, <clears throat> you know, male men, uh, you, you know, men can be so easily manipulated and um, the, uh, the men who don't understand the power of uh, having uh, women uh, in leadership roles, you know, as a, as an entrepreneur and a CEO myself, I don't want other men to know that because, you know, I want that advantage all for myself, right? But um, yeah, it 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 will it will become, uh, you know, a female uh, majority board, you know, environment. It may take, you know, twenty years, but uh, but it's inevitable and. Um, so take it from me, right? I'm the I'm the guy that was, you know, 25 years ago creating what you guys know of as Wi-Fi, right? So I always saw, you know, what it was that we would be doing uh, today, you know, by commoditizing that offering. So there, there was just a small group of us. It was all men, right? But um, I just need to find more and more women who want to do uh, engineering, right? and stay in the engineering field to create, you know, products and designs and stuff like that. So um, more power to you. Any any women who uh, want, you know, any sort of help with anything in, you know, bridging this divide, you know, just drop me a message, okay? I got to go. Bye. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart uh, said something really important. Be yourself. You're not there to act like somebody else. You're there to be you. And it's one of my favorite things that I say to my 11-year-old daughter. I have two sons and a daughter, as Ian mentioned in the intro, is you be you. She's always worried about what other people think and how other people size her up or how she fits in. And, I, and, and those things matter. Of course, they matter. I mean, Linda mentioned this idea of a culture on a board or a community. It, it matters. But you also have to be authentic. You have to be yourself. And you need to be you and bring out the best in yourself in that experience. And it will bring out the best in everyone around you. Absolutely. We have Mark on, on uh, who's unmuted. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, thanks. Thanks to all of you. That a very, very dense number of issues that you guys hit, or you ladies and gentlemen hit in a very short period of time. Uh, you know, I, I've encountered this issue twice in my career. Once was when I was in grad school doing interviews for a project. And I was told that, um, yeah, he contacted me because he said he couldn't find any women for the board. 
And this is a major healthcare system in Northern, uh, Northern California. There's not a chance in hell he couldn't find another woman. Uh, and I think that was the only one that was great. She was the only one that's going to be added. Okay. So I was like, this is crazy. You know, Jane's telling me this and like, this is one of the biggest, most respected organizations in the, in the state. They're so connected. They've got half women working in their organization as a healthcare organization, at least not more. Uh, so I refuse to believe they can't source this. And then I came across this again, uh, but in a very positive way, just to show you how the thinking's changed, at least among my generation uh, in you know, the early 40s, mid 40s. Uh, I have a client now that I've been working with for a while, and I'm now impaneling my first board. I've been on four before, but I'm impaneling the first one uh, and, that I've ever done, and it's a corporate board. And he asked for women. And, and I said, you bet. And I found at least four of the, off the top of my head out of eight, I think we may have a 50%. So, uh, you know, if I can add anybody else, I'm going to do it. I went for the skills. That's what matters. It's skills and the ability to dialogue and be respectful. You're absolutely right. A little bit of imagination, a strategic mindset. That's all you need. And you need some hands offness. Just as Elizabeth said, I think you're absolutely right at the governance level. And this is what I'm doing as I sold the board to them. I said, look, you are advisory. We are to come to you as executive management until we can rotate ourselves off the board and from you know, after the startup phase. Uh, and just the CEOs there, you know, you guys are a resource to him in a way that he's not going to get from his management. And I know who you are. So I know you're going to add value. Will you please do this? And fortunately, they all said yes. And it was absolutely based on what they could contribute. That's all it was because groupthink is dangerous, pernicious, destructive. So yeah, and, and especially the bigger the company, the more damage they can do with that kind of uh, lack of balance in the governance. So just a couple of thoughts from me. I mean, great job. I mean, I was here to learn and I learned and it turned a lot of wheels for me, just like Stuart, you know, we didn't know the problem was that bad. Um, I don't, don't, and the reason I asked the question about management and governance is understanding where, you know, that, that Delta is, you know, it's taken us a long time to get to parity and management. So, you know, on what track, you know, what slope has that been on compared to the progress in the board arena? You know, was kind of my, you know, my intuition. Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for, for your comments and, and your contribution. I believe Scott has a question. I'm going to un unmute Scott. Um, so, Scott, uh, why don't you ask the, um, the panelists? Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, I think one of the key things that uh, I focus on is I, is I, I coach a lot of high, high potential females. And one of the things that um, I, I see is there's this, this dearth of, I call it women leadership forums. I know Rita McGrath has something that she did at, at Columbia and, and Barnard College that really brought the high potential women together. And I put a couple of women from my team uh, into that session, but I don't see a lot of, of, of visibility. And I was just curious from the panel, what, what other opportunities are out there for someone like myself who's been a promoter of talent and how to get them more exposure across an entire platform that might be available to me. So you, so Scott, you're asking for ways to take the group of high performing women that you've been coaching and raise their visibility and extend their influence so that they're considered for boards. Correct. Okay. There are many organizations that literally are uh, promoting women for board positions. That's their entire intent. That's in their entire mission and purpose. Um, I'm happy to send you a few recommendations. 
But if you just literally Google that, you'll find that there are more and more organizations that are popping up that teach and train women how to prepare for board positions, but importantly, also organizations that take high potential board uh, governance women and literally place them. They help them craft their board bio, and then they submit that board bio to those boards that they know are looking for a more gender balanced board moving forward. And so they become the advocates for those high performing and high potential leaders. I think, I think definitely, that, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say thank you. I think it would be really important though, from an outside perspective is I, I was looking for a, a few because one of the key things, right, is I don't want a lot of advertising. I want action. And so trying to figure out which ones are the, are the and that's the reason why I asked the question, is really narrow down the, the ones that you really see as successful. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. There's so definitely organizations out there. I mean, one that comes to mind for me is Advisory Board Architects. So um, they help you craft. Yeah. They're often involved when you're creating an advisory board for a private company. And I, I think this, again, this kind of gets back to governance, but if it's a brand new board, it's what are you looking for? Um, what's, your, what's the end game? What, what, do you, what do you want the board to accomplish? And what are the goals of the board? And then how do you back into it? What type of diversity do you need? Diversity of experience, diversity of thought, diversity of gender, race, whatever, to get the right mindset onto that board. And then are you interviewing, what's your process? Do you interview your directors? Do you do any psychological testing on them before you put them in a board position? I mean, I wouldn't hire a senior executive in my business without knowing what I was getting. Why would you put somebody on a board without knowing what you're getting, especially if you don't have term limits? especially if you're non-confrontational and it's culturally difficult or challenging for your board to quote fire directors. So I think um, it's just like when you hire an employee, go in with your eyes wide open and try to capture the very best that you can find. As far as female resources, um, th there are so many out there today that didn't exist three or five years ago um, to help promote women, get them on boards. And one thing um, Linda mentioned, I think earlier was a board resume. Your board resume shouldn't look anything like your corporate resume. It right. should be totally different. And if you need help, there's lots of organizations and resources out there to help you craft a board resume. Yeah, your board bio is, is just a critical um, instrument, but uh, Bob at Board Architects is, is amazing. There are also a lot of um, opportunities to promote women who are ready for that board seat, who have the experience, who have the depth of financial acumen, who have unique specialties that could really be impactful for boards. There are a lot of organizations now that help those women get connected to the boards that are looking for the kind of experience, the kind of diversity that that woman rep rep uh, represents. And to me, that's a great way to begin to raise the profile and expand the influence of women that are ready to take that step. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thanks everybody for being on um, this webinar. It's been such an insightful time. And, and to Linda and Elizabeth, this is such an important topic. And uh, I couldn't thank you enough for, for taking your time out of your busy schedule to uh, speak. Uh, with our audience. Um, once again, for everybody who's uh, not with us uh, today uh, in, in this uh, digital session, it would, uh, the recording will be uploaded onto YouTube and shared across uh, the entire mailing list. So um, thank you once again, Linda and Elizabeth for being here. Uh, it was such a pleasure to have both of you uh, and we connect again. Uh, once again, thank you and uh, for everybody else. Thank you for being here. All right, uh, so I'll be ending the webinar now and uh, look out for our next webinar, which uh, hopefully will be featuring some uh, really important uh, heart-stopping uh, heart topics as well. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>